For the longest time, I always found it odd how the cyberpunk genre seemed to have a strange obsession with Japan. All across these stories, you'll find Japanese text, culture, and characters. But this actually makes sense. These movies date back to the 1980s, a time period where the rise and growth of Japan was crazy. Japan was going through an economic miracle. In just three decades, Japan had gone from a small agricultural country, devastated by war, to becoming the world's second biggest economy. Japan was beating the USA in tech, cars, and even video games. Japan's eventual surpassing of the US seemed inevitable. But of course we know this didn't happen. The Japanese bubble burst and Japan stagnated. And yet you still continue to see Japanese influence in cyberpunk. But I am here to argue that current Japan is way worse than any cyberpunk movie, novel, or video game that you have ever seen. It's always been a staple of cyberpunk media to feature massive domineering corporations. Blade Runner has the Tyrell Corporation, Final Fantasy VII has Shinra, and Japan has Mitsubishi. It's hard to overstate the power and impact that Mitsubishi has in Japanese culture and society. You may think of Mitsubishi as is simply a car manufacturer company, but is actually an incredibly diverse mega corporation. The Mitsubishi Group is made out of more than 80 companies and subsidiaries, the most famous of them being, of course, Mitsubishi Motors, who is dedicated to make everyday cars. This is what normally comes to mind when you think Mitsubishi, but there are, of course, a number of others, such as Mitsubishi Paper Mills, which is a paper manufacturer company, Mitsubishi UFJ Securities, which does stock trading, Mitsubishi Plastics, which produces various plastics, Nippon Yusen, which is a shipping company, Seikei University, which you guess it is a university, and of course how we could forget about Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, which makes everything from air conditioners and printing machines up to tanks and rockets. The both kinds, so yeah, pretty much the whole range. According to some estimates, the Mitsubishi Group makes up roughly 10% of the Japanese economy, which is totally absurd. This level of dominance over the country lacks any real comparison, so it should come as no surprise that Mitsubishi is Japan's largest employer, employing over half a million people across the country. For comparison, even the United States' largest employer, Walmart, makes only 2.5 percent of the workforce, or roughly 400,000 people. 100,000 less than Mitsubishi. The level of control that Mitsubishi has over Japan is insane. Just looking at it at a cultural level. If you ask a Japanese primary schooler what they want to be when they grow up, there is a pretty good chance that they will say, work for Mitsubishi. Kids in Japan have it drilled into their brains that getting a job at a big company like Mitsubishi is the key to a better and more prestigious life. This isn't an easy task. However, children even from an incredibly young age are taught that if they want a chance to succeed and work in a big company like Mitsubishi, they'll have to do very well in school and get into a prestigious university. Japanese society places an incredible significance on education. A normal day of a high schooler student could go like this. School day starts at 8.30, but wait, you have to arrive at least 15 to 20 minutes before, because in Japan being on time is being late. Then you would have normal classes until 3.30, but the day isn't over, because then comes the club activities, which could be mandatory or don't. But it doesn't matter because it is expected by society that you do it otherwise, you will be considered consider a sloth and or a delinquent, something that will certainly will not look good on your university application, and you obviously wouldn't like that. But anyway, your club activities ended at 6, so now after almost 10 hours of work, you are free to relax and enjoy your short but valuable teenage years, right? Wrong, because after that you have to attend a privately owned, for-profit cram night school, which could end between 10 or 11 p.m. And now you may say, well now I can at least go to my home, relax and do one of those things that makes life worth living, like what are they called? Oh yeah, hobbies, or talk with your friends or loved ones, spend some quality time with your parents or grandma, you know? Before you have to do the essential necessity of sleeping right? Wrong, because now is homework and study time, and maybe, just maybe if you are lucky you could sleep 5 or 4 hours. And by the way, you still have to attend school on Saturday. Saturdays. And depending in which club you are, it could also be, not demanded, but expected of you to attend Saturdays after class and Sundays. Overall, students may spend as much as 16 or even 18 hours studying in a day, going home only to sleep. This due to that, even more so than in other countries getting into a top university in Japan, is a big deal. And surprisingly enough, doing a test is not the only way to get into one. This will depend from university to university. And if it is a private or a public one, but is not uncommon for universities to accept students just based on their high school grades or recommendations of the principals of their schools, which could sound like a good thing at first sight. If you maybe aren't that good at exams, they could seem like there are other ways to get into a good university for you that just a good grade. But then the dream breaks, when you now realize that instead of doing a one-day exam for which you could prepare and study throughout many years, you now have to excel every day in everything. Because you will be competing with all the other students in your grade for that principal's recommendation if there's even one in the first place, because it is not written anywhere that the director has to give one, so it's not rare to hear students 
stories of foul play between students to make your competition look worse. But hey, as the saying goes, hate the game, not the player. Now multiply this for all the high schools in the country where they probably are a lot of students that will be competing for the same limited spots in the university of your desires. And now you have a system where if you don't have perfect grades, don't even bother. Oh yeah, and if you failed at the test, too bad, better luck next year, because there's just one test per year. So you'll have to endure another grueling year of studying, and with now the entire pressure of your family on your back? After all, is your duty as a good son to succeed? Because first, they all had to endure the same, breaking their back so you could have a nice and comfy life. And second is because in Japanese culture, is expected of the sons to take care of their parents when they get older. So the better you do at school, slash studying the better university you will go to, the more successful you will be, and the better life that you will be able to give to your parents. Oh, and I almost forgot you only get one chance in your lifetime, not because of a law, but because of an unspoken rule in Japanese culture that I will explain in a bit. So now you are one of a few lucky ones that got into the top university that you wanted. Congratulations. Now your parents may reward you by giving you the gift of being one of the more than a quarter of million of people that each year receive a plastic surgery in Japan. After all, a more attractive face will give you a leg up in the job market. This seem insane to people in the West, but yes, this is true. And it's almost a cliche at this point. Of course, there are others who may never be able to find success using the traditional way and will be forced to look for a different path. Some may abandon their dreams and work in manufacturing, while others may try to follow their passion to become professional mangakas, having to work 17 plus hours daily with no weekends. Some may even try to become idols, a type of Japanese singer slash actor slash entertainment slash role model. But even there, you would not be able to escape the system and the extreme work culture. When someone becomes an idol, he or she basically has to sign a contract in which they agreed that a company will control every facet of their lives for years. What you eat by giving you an extreme and unhealthy diet. What you do and who you see, in essence and idol, has to renounce having a private life in any way, shape or form. They are prohibited from having a boyfriend or girlfriend, much less have children, and will have to endure extreme practice hours and will literally be dropped by their label at the first scandal, which could be something as simple as just having a relationship, because nothing less than perfection is expected from them. But at least the pay makes all this sacrifice worth it, you may say. But you'll be wrong again. They aren't that much more wealthy than what you or me probably are. This because of very predatory contracts that the talent has to sign just in order to become famous, in which the company will take 80 or 90% of their earnings. Let me repeat, that is not 80 or 90% of the money that you will be producing if you become an idol. That's 80 or 90% of that money after you remove all expenses, with the pay being less if you are part of a group where you have to split the money even more, with each participant taking a cut. And please be careful, as is a guarantee that you at least will have a few dozen of stalkers that are willing to do anything and everything to get close to you. But not to careful as to not see like you don't like them. Because first, the appeal of idols is that they are selling the idea that they can be your girlfriend slash boyfriend. That's why they are prohibited from having a partner. As you see, according to a survey, 61% of men between the ages of 18 to 34 doesn't have a partner with almost 40% never having a girlfriend to begin with. And the same story tends to repeat with women. And second, because that will be seen as rude, disrespectful, and you not loving your dear fans who are giving you all their support and money so you can escape the system and finally live your dreams. This extreme work culture which propelled Japan onto the world stage as a major economy is also slowly destroying it. Extreme overworking has caused a mental and health epidemic, so much so that they even invented the term karoshi, which means death by overwork. And karoshi isn't like a new thing. It's a word that has been in the Japanese lexicon since the 80s. This is considered one of the main causes of the low birth that Japan is currently facing. Since the mid 70s, Japan has seen nothing but less and less births as each year passes, with 2005 being the first year where more people died than were born. And since then, things only have gotten worse. Just last year, Japan's population shrinked by 1 million in comparison with the year before. And yearly diaper sales for adults have overpassed the sale of diapers for babies since 2016. So it's only a matter of time before Japan runs out of young people to work in its factories, pay their taxes, and take care of the elderly. And there doesn't seem to be a solution in the horizon to this problem. Despite numerous recommendations from other organizations and countries like the UN, Canada, and some European nations that before were in the same situation, Japan has refused every time to open its borders to immigrants with just 2% of its population being from outside of Japan, with a good chunk of those really being children from Japanese fathers that move out of Japan and that now are moving to Japan. So not the much foreign, if you ask me. And instead, the government has resource to use robots as its solution, which hasn't worked. But why they don't want to welcome foreigners? I am glad you ask. Well, as we saw a few moments ago, the current population of Japan tends to be older, with the majority being near its 50s or more. And without getting into politics and what is right and wrong, and just sticking to the facts, this segment of the population tends to be more 
conservative, which means they favor the status quo and tend to be against the change. Plus, with the fact that less than a third of young people in Japan vote which, historically, are the segment of the population that are pro-change, well, you get that Japanese immigration laws haven't really changed that much for decades. And it also doesn't help the fact that creating a group that dares to face the status quo is in a lot of cases an uphill battle. Japan is a very collectivist society, which means that in contrast to what we are taught in school in this side of the world, where individualism is valued more than anything else, in Japan is the contrary. Standing out is almost an undesirable trait. They even have a saying for this, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. So it is expected of an individual to put first the necessities of the many before its own, even when this thinking may not give the best results. So a lot of times people just don't express their disliking of the establishment, and it also doesn't help that even though in paper Japan is a democracy, in reality, not so much. With the same party being in the power since the 40s, with only two exceptions in 1993 and in 2009, which may only happen due to the two more extreme economic recessions that Japan has faced in its recent history, the second one happening because of the 2007 recession, and the first one happening because of something that we will discuss later in the video. The party who basically runs Japanese politics is called the Liberal Democratic Party, or LDP for short, which despite what its name may suggest, is actually a very conservative party. They have so much power that he or she who becomes the president of the party is commonly referred as just the Japan Prime Minister, as it tradition that the one who rules the party will be in the ballot's next election, and with almost 100% certainty will win ups. Sorry, I just made a mistake there, because that's not actually how Japanese politics work. Things there work different from the West, because what actually happens in election day is that you just vote for the party that you want to win, and they in your name elect who they want to become Prime Minister. And by the way, this isn't a UK situation where they tell the public who are they going to elect before election day. This just happens after they won. And if you want to change how this system works because you don't like it, good luck as the LDP has more than half of the seats in the Diet, their equivalent of the House of Representatives, and the Senate in the US, or the Parliament in the UK. Note, before the 2000s, here in Mexico, we used to be in the same situation with the ruling party named Pria being in the power for almost 60 years. And you know how we used to call this phenomenon? The perfect dictatorship. It goes without saying that corruption is rampant in Japanese politics, but all these things that the Japanese public must have endured, like the grueling work culture, the big and almighty companies, the social pressure to excel, and the lack of, let's say it, a real democracy, is at least worth it, right? At least you could expect to leave a life full of luxury, or at the very least one with enough money so you don't have to worry about it. Well, you do remember when I said that Japan changed their ruling party in 93 for the first time in its history? Well, that change was the consequence of an event known as the Lost Decade. Let's rewind the clock a little bit, back to the 80s, to answer two important questions. Why and how did the Japanese economic bubble burst? And more important, what was the aftermath of it? First, some background. Since the end of the Second World War, Japan had saw a huge economic uprise, like never saw in history, not before nor after. It was named the Japanese Miracle. Japan even got a nickname, the Asian Tiger. Everyone in the West was left wondering how a country that just a century ago had been closed from the outside world economically and physically for almost three centuries, who just experienced the destructive power of two atomic bombs, the loss of the majority of its territory, a coup and takeover from a foreign government, could in just a few decades be now facing head to head to the almighty USA, the same country that took control of him a few decades ago, as the second biggest economy, for God's sake. There were even some people discussing that maybe Japan had already surpassed the USA economy as the ruling power. All the top five banks were Japanese, the biggest car and technology manufacturers were Japanese, they were even making their own entertainment that was beginning to compete with Hollywood. I think this next fact sums up pretty well how big of a deal Japan was, because is bonkers, just the ground where the real palace was, was worth more than the entire land of the state of California. But all this, the big parties, the suits, the luxury cars, and then the house market collapsed. Everything came crashing down in a big fashion with the coming of the new decade. Just in 1990, the Japanese economy went down by 43%, almost half of what it was just a year ago. People started calling Japan the crouching tiger or the sleeping tiger of Asia. It goes without saying that it was not a good time to be a Japanese worker, especially someone entering the workforce. If you were someone who entered to work in a big company a year before, you were one of the lucky ones because, yeah, you would have to endure the high prices, the depreciating value of the yen, the Japanese currency, and of your house. But at least you had a paying job. Due to how Japanese laws work, they have this concept of worker for life. In the majority of cases, it's literally impossible for the company to fire his employees unless they do something very, very bad. And I am talking like newsworthy bad, which makes companies very careful with who they hired. So a lot of companies, the bigger ones, the ones that everyone wants to get into, have one annual event where they will do all the hiring of that year. Yeah, just one time for the entire year. And they have the policy of just hiring people fresh out from university, which minds they could mold to fit the company culture. So let's just, I don't know, hypothetically say if one sudden unseen, unheard of event that would change the economy of Japan
Japan for decades to come so big as to be the culprit of making Japan the country with the biggest external debt in the world, said debt being two times bigger than all the money Japan produces in one year, even to this day, after more than three decades after the event happened. And that by law, you as a company are prohibited from firing people. In order to cut expenses, what would you do? Yeah, they didn't hire anyone for several years, and this had big consequences. You see, the people that were graduating from college and university suddenly found that they had a title, which was essentially worthless. They could do nothing with it because no one was hiring. And hey, bad luck. They will just have to try better luck next year. And if the same happens, then they'll just need to try next year. And if the same happens, then they'll just need to try next year. And if I think you can see where I am going with this, this no hiring policy continued for multiple years. And by the time companies began to hire again, a lot of years have passed. So as this company saw it, they had two options. Either hire someone with no experience in the field who already had experience in other jobs, like part-time, little companies, etc. Which meant that you couldn't mold his or her mind from zero because they already experienced the culture of another as they saw it, lesser companies, and who because were older basically meant that due to the law you will be stuck with them from life, so they will be working less years for you because they will hit age of retiring sooner. Or option two, you hire a fresh guy right out of college who didn't had none of those cons. Again, what will you do if you were a company? They went with the latter, and as a result of this, a huge part of the population couldn't find work and had to resort to little works here and there. Maybe some part-time jobs, but nothing concrete and is estimated that today, half of Japanese workers live in a similar situation. This event affected all faces of Japan because this people didn't had a job. It meant that they couldn't buy a house, so they took one of two paths. A. They stay with their parents, never lefting the nest, never being independent, and probably because of how Japanese society works and how they tend to put much of the blame on the individual will feel a shame of themselves, pushing some to shut the outside world and to never leave their rooms subsisting only of anime and video games to fill their fantasies, which will later be named the hikikomori phenomenon were, is estimated that as 2023, 1.46 million of people in working age leave in self-confinement, some having decades without literally putting a foot outside. And after 2020, I don't think I need to tell you what this does to a human being, mental state. And yeah, it also gives me Ready Player One vibes. And then we have Path B, you decide or are forced to leave the nest without a proper job. So you cannot find a house, but because you cannot find a house, cannot also find a proper job. So you get the very best next thing. You stay at a manga cafe, a place where for a fee, you could stay the whole day in a room of four by seven with yeah, some food and in some cases free drinks and yeah, manga, but still a place of four by seven where you are expected to live and do all your necessities. Again, after 2020, I can relate. But the saddest thing is that we don't exactly know how many people live in this conditions because the Japanese government refuses to give the numbers because as they see it, they are not homeless. They aren't in the streets. They have a roof and a quote unquote bed were to sleep according to them, Japan. Despite being one of the countries with the biggest population in the world, having 125 million people and the most populated city in the world. Tokyo, with more than 30 million people, only has 3,000 homeless, less than 0.003% of the population, the lowest in the world. And again, because of how Japanese society works, a lot of the blame is put on the individual. So although it exists, it's hard to make a movement to help this people, who literally sometimes are not just living like paycheck to paycheck, but day to day as it is calculated that near half of Japanese workers work in an informal, part-time, temporal, or in a minimum wage job. And because of how competitive the job market is, there is even the more difficult to get yourself out of that situation, as there are a lot of people that are in a similar situation that in theory are as much as you or even more qualified than you. So there's not really a shortage of people of your age and similar situation that could also fill the few good jobs that there are left. But hey, aren't we forgetting something here? Like, yeah, government and society are in part to blame as in every cyberpunk dystopia. But what about the companies? They surely have something of blame here, right? Yeah, they do. You see, Japan have this thing called Kiretsu, which basically is kind of one big conglomerate and kind of not. The TLDR is this. Imagine you have a bunch of companies and they tend to share a similar name. For example, there's Mitsubishi Motors, Mitsubishi Plastic, Electrics, Aircraft, Chemicals. You get the idea. Up until now, it doesn't sound that different from what we have here in America or Europe. Big conglomerates aren't a new thing, but here is where it starts to get interesting. All these companies that conform the Kiretsu group own shares of each of the other, which basically means they owned a little part of each other, which means they are incentivized to not let any of the companies that conforms the Kiretsu group to fall, because the fall of one could really hurt the others, or even mean their own fall. So for example, let's say that Mitsubishi puts on the market a new car that isn't selling that well. In that case, maybe the other companies of the group, in order to prevent a drop of the shares that they own, will go and buy hundreds of that car model, with the excuse 
use that is for their companies, or even recommend, and in some cases, force their workers to get one themselves. Or let's say another case, maybe I make dairy products, and because of an accident, I ended up making way more cheese than what I am capable of selling, and maybe that is going to really hurt my bottom line. So here comes other company from the Kiretsu group that makes food. Well, now this company that we are going to be call X will use all this excess of cheese to create a new product, which he will sell to another company of the Keiretsu, which has a lot of convenience stores in which they will sell my product. But guess what? After a few weeks, the product doesn't sell because no one was asking for it. It was just created because it was needed to be created, not because any of the clients of the convenience store wanted it. So now there's two options. Either we repeat the car scenario or we keep pumping down the product, taking the limited shelf space that we have in the process, not letting new products from other companies get to the consumer and thrive. Which means that if you are a consumer, you now have fewer options that you would have otherwise. And if you are an entrepreneur wanting to start a new business, which sells a new product that is cheese related, well, bad luck. There is no place where to sell it, and the power is still kept by a few powerful ones. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that the percentage of people wanting to own its own business in Japan is almost three times less than what it is in the US. But I hear you, Vandervy. Then I just won't buy any of the Mitsubishi products and all will be fine. They will not have my money, and so everyone else, and with enough time, they will collapse. But here is the thing. Even though if you and your friends band together to not ever buy any Mitsubishi product, there is a problem. Not every company that conforms, the Kiretsu, is called Mitsubishi. There is, for example, Asahi or Nikon Witch are part of the group, but they don't share the Mitsubishi name. And what's more, you can sometimes be obligated to use them, because they very well could be your only option, and they are so big and convenient that you can easily be leaving an entire day, just using their products and services, as they could be the one that constructed and operate the building where you live, the makers of the anime, movies, or TV shows that you watch, the hospital where you take your father for an important operation, which is paid by a Mitsubishi healthcare plan. The energy that you are using right now, or the train tath, you will be using tomorrow to get to work. The water and food that eat that you bought at the convenience store, owned by Mitsubishi, all that and much more, can be part of the Mitsubishi group. Even the money they pay you at work could be owned by Mitsubishi, as they also have a bank. Because of course they also have a bank, which by the way, is one of the five biggest banks in the world, and which functions as the heart and leader of the entire Kiretsu, being in the center of the group, lending money left and right to everyone that conforms it, making so that everyone on the Kiretsu essentially has a 24 7 ATM that will lend them unlimited money, because it's in the best interest of the bank that nobody goes bankrupt. At the beginning of the video, I may have lied a bit. Japan doesn't just have Mitsubishi as its corporate overlord, it also has five others. Fuyo, Sanwa, Sumitomo, Mitsui, and DKB Group. This six are known as the Big Six. They make the majority of the Japanese economy. They are essentially untouchable, as in essence, they have the entire Japanese government as his hostage, if just one of them were to fall. It's very possible that the entire Japanese economy may collapse. Thus, the Japanese government has little choice but to let these companies do as they please.